but yeah, I do think sometimes that heroes tossed around uh, a little too loosely. I'm going to bring up a story that was here in the Bay Area years ago. I'm not going to bring up any names, and it's not specific enough where I think I'm going to hurt anybody's feelings and if they happen to know these. But I, I remember watching the news, and there was a, an older gentleman sitting on the couch with his you know grandkid who was like eight or something, seven, six, and he was talking about how his grandkid was his hero. He saved his life because he had a heart attack and the kid dialed 911. All right, listen, that's fine. Between grandpa and grandkid, if you want to say you're my hero, that's cool. But for public uh, for public conversation, that's no hero. If the kid would have you know fought off a pack of pit bulls to get to the phone to dial 911, then I'm going to give him hero status. Right. Uh, but outside of that, I'm like, let me ask you something. Is, uh, is Sully a hero? Yes. Is a is a pilot who simply performs their job and in an emergency situation was able to land a plane and save, you know, everybody on board. Nobody died. Yeah, I think given the circumstances, yeah. If you're somebody on that plane, yes, you you're you're saying you are my hero as you're walking off. But he you know, and again, I think a hero needs to be defined as somebody who puts themselves in harm's way in order to help out somebody else. And in that situation, he didn't put himself in harm's way. Harm's way found him. And he was able to get that plane on the you know, in the water safely and everybody lived. And I can understand why everybody on that plane would go, That is my hero. I can understand why that grandfather would go, That kid is my hero because he saved your life. But we need to come up with another word for saving somebody's life, but you don't put your life in peril. Or am I just? Am I being too much of a jerk when it comes to a, uh, the hero status, Johnny Torres? No, you're right. I think it, it is often thrown around, and I think people don't. You know, it's just an overused word. Uh, but uh, I, I think you're maybe wanting to define it a little too succinctly. You know, because again, Sully, yes, doing his job. Did he save hundreds of lives? Uh, adequately landing that plane in the Hudson River? Yes, absolutely. And and I think he should be classified as a hero for doing so because based on the accounts from other pilots, um, it, that what he did was... Extraordinary yes. or normal? Like no, it was extraordinary. Really? So I, you, you talking to the other pilots are going, hey man, that, that was a good job. I don't know if I could have done that. Or does every right. pilot go, oh, I, I could have done that too. No, well, that's what I'm saying. I think had it, had it been like, oh, okay, well, anybody could have landed the plane in the Hudson, then yeah, I'd say you were right. Like, the, it's no big deal. But uh, but given the fact that what he did, was, the, the way that he was able to land the plane with no casualties, I think was extraordinary enough to make him a hero. Okay. super Superhero? <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, Noah drinks from his uh, Superman mug. Yep. How you doing, Noah King? I'm doing well. How y'all doing this morning? Uh, good, sir. Thank you so much. And uh, welcome to the Wake Dot Show. I'm Fisher, and uh, along with Johnny uh, Torres here. And you know Cord. You know the owner of uh, Bake More Pies. You guys played ball together at uh, That's Georgia right. at Georgia Tech. That is correct. Uh, do you do you, so? What I I didn't know this about Cords. You're an offensive lineman, so I'm assuming that you are not. Uh, you know, five ten, 140 pounds. No, no, I was about 6'2", 270, 280 at my, at my highest. When I, my senior year, I was probably about my biggest, about 280. And I would imagine Cords back then was even smaller than he is now. <laughs> I don't know how small he is now, but <laughs> yeah, he was definitely smaller than I was. But, uh, uh, but he was a place kicker, so that's how you guys know each other. And uh, he, he shared with us your story about you winning or where you were being awarded the Carnegie Medal for Outstanding Civilian Heroism. Um, tell, tell us about that, about getting that phone call and, and how, how did this organization track you down and say, Hey man, we want to give you this, uh, this prize. Well, uh, basically I got, uh, after the incident in October, I think it was, um, sometime in December, I got a letter from the Carnegie, uh, hero fund, um, saying that I'd been nominated for the award, um, and that they would be contacting me and, other people uh, to go through the process. Um, and after that, I received phone calls, interviews, questionnaires asking me about the incident, what happened. Uh, my coworker, Beverly, who was there, um, she was uh, interviewed by the people over there at the Carnegie Hero Fund. On. Um, they asked for my medical records. Uh, uh, I think they contacted other people. I'm not too sure, just the people that I know. Your medical um, records? And then it was just found out a couple weeks ago. Your medical records? Why did they? Why? Why they want your medical records? They want to make sure you didn't weren't doing any drugs uh, or something. In, in, 
in some cases, if there's if you get uh, hurt or something like that, they will they will compensate you uh, oh, I for that. But I, I was I was very very lucky. I just had some gashes on my knuckle, uh, nothing significant at all. So that's the reason oh. I asked for medical. I thought it was a little odd myself as well. So they weren't asking for medical records going back to childhood. They were just they, from the incident itself. They wanted to confirm that you had been injured during this thing. Correct, and I think it's another way they're just following through, making sure that this the story is as as it was uh, uh, played out to be. Because they do have some, uh, the lady I talked to, Missy over there, she said they do have some issues where people have kind of staged uh, heroic stuff, and so that's why they go through the interview process. And I think oh, that wow. was part of it to maybe compensate me if I was hurt, uh, and also just to kind of to ver- help verify the story as well. Is there a cash? Is there a cash award that comes along with the Carnegie uh, Carnegie Medal? Yes, there is, um, and it all depends um, exactly what happens. Uh, uh, people who've lost their lives, they'll um, they'll possibly compensate uh, their children through a, a college fund or a widow through uh, some type of pension type payment. Uh, I'm not exactly sure. I was I was given five thousand dollars, so um, that's that's that was pretty neat. Oh yeah. wow, that is. <laughs> Man, you're now now you're now you're out there patrolling the roads looking for cars to uh you're looking for people to save. <laughs> I don't I don't care to ever do that again if I don't have to. <laughs> well, Noah King, let's talk about the incident that is uh, uh that has gotten you onto this uh, onto the show and into the news recently. And that is October 25th, 2016, Panama City, Florida. Uh Correct. take us through that. Uh well, I was actually coming back from uh Speaking at American Cancer Society Relay for Life kickoff party, I was asked to speak as a uh, cancer survivor. Um, I was diagnosed with cancer in June that year, um, and then it was pretty fast acting after that. I was all in Mayo Clinic in July, then August 9th, I had surgery over in Jacksonville, Mayo. Um, and so I was leaving that and coming down the street. Uh, I don't know if familiar with the area, but down Baldwin Road, and there's a particular section um, that's it's kind of dark, not a lot of lights, but over on the left-hand side of the road, um, something looked odd. I, I could tell it was a fire or something, and so as I got close to it, I stopped uh, across from it, and I noticed it was a fire, but I still couldn't tell exactly what, what it was. So me and my coworker, we both, who was following me at the time, we both pulled over, um, and as we started walking towards the fire, I noticed it was a vehicle upside, upside down, um, I pulled out my phone, tried to call 911, and I was uh, just a, a wreck. And I looked over at Beverly, I'm like, can you please call 911? I can't work my phone apparently right now. So we walk over. As we get close, I could hear like a we could hear like a knocking or or a oh, banging. Geez. And so, so I walked down the culvert over to the vehicle, and it was the, the driver's side that was uh, that was up like this. And uh, so I go over there and I look through the window, and I see that the gentleman is standing up and he's trying to actually kick the windshield out. Um, and so I banged on the window and he just kind of looked over me and then he went right back to kicking the windshield, trying to get out through the front. Um, and th- so I banged on it again and then he got his attention and said, just stand back. And so I was going to try to break the window. And so I hit it with my forearm the first time. I didn't, I didn't know exactly what was going to happen. So I didn't hit it as hard as I as probably should have. So I hit it one time. Um, nothing happened that I hit it again. And then the third time I got, uh, honestly, I kind of was getting a little worried at that point because the fire was, was increasing at that point. And so I hit it the third time. Uh, I broke through the winch, through the, the driver's side window. And then I stuck about, I don't know, about halfway through the window and I asked if there's anybody else in the car. He said, no. I said, are you sure? Is there anybody else in the car? He said, no. Uh, he said, I, I think I broke my leg. And so I reached and I grabbed underneath his shoulders and I pulled them out through the window and then I dragged them um, up the culvert and then away from the vehicle. And then when I broke the window, that's when the fire really started to, to take off. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, – in a nutshell, that's what happened. And I'm not, I, I don't want to make too light of the situation, but was it one of those things like as soon as you dragged him far enough away from the car, then the car exploded, like in the movies? No. Damn. <laughs> no, but that was definitely my concern. When I, was, when I was walking over to the vehicle and I was trying to dial 911 with my phone, I was thinking, like, what are you doing? Why are you walking over here? You have a family. What are you doing? I just I just kept walking. Is this thing going to blow up? I had, I had no idea, um, but it just – to me, it was the right thing to do. I, I, I know somebody needed help, and so that's why I just, just kept going, I guess. <laughs> it's interesting how the brain works at that point. You have your the, the analytical part of you going, what are you doing, dude? You got your wife, your kid. You, you, know, you got a lot of things going on here. You can't be walking towards a fire. And the other part of you is walking towards the fire while you're having this conversation. 
Yeah, I pretty much talking myself and like, what are you doing? This is this is uh, this is crazy. And I was and I was I was terrified. I was scared because I did not know. I don't know if the car is going to explode. I didn't yeah. know exactly how bad the fire was, how many people were in there. I just there's just so many unknowns walking up to it. So I think it was uh, very lucky that it was probably just one driver, and I was able to get him out uh, fairly quickly. And that I came upon it seemed that we got there pretty soon after the accident happened. Uh, so it's it's not something that we got there and it would already engulf the car or anything like that. So I think that was that was fairly lucky that we came across it as soon as it happened, it seemed like. So what's it feel like when they start tossing around the term hero and you start getting phone calls from Carnegie and the <laughs> newspapers and they're calling you a hero, calling you a hero? That's a, uh, that's a very tough pill to swallow for me. Yeah. Because uh, like I said, I view what I did is the right thing to do. And I don't think I should be elevated to any other status of, of hero. You see a lot of these other uh, recipients um, who have lost their lives or something like that. I mean, to me, that's you know epitome. And you have, you know, the EMTs and the police department and the fire department who do that every single day. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's very, it's been very, very humbling, um, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's very hard for me to take that, that term. Uh, well, Noah, you know, I don't think there's ever been a hero that once they've had that moment and then somebody comes and goes, uh, hey, man, you're a hero. I think most I think most heroes are probably like you where they go, no, man, that, that's something anybody would have done in that moment. I doubt there'd be somebody go, damn right. I'm a hero. Don't you ever <laughs> don't you ever forget it. <laughs> I'm a hero. I'm a hero. I think once you go through that, it automatically humbles you, and then everybody else gets the right to, uh, you know, call you a hero on that. I was being kind of a jerk this morning, and I've been kind of a jerk my entire career when it comes to this stuff because I say that you're not a hero unless you are putting your life in danger to help somebody else. Like, you know, I don't know if you were listening uh, right before we uh, went to you, but we were talking about like a, a kid, you know, dials 911 because his grandfather's having a heart attack. Yeah, the grandfather's gonna say, you're my hero, I get it, that's cool. But, uh, but, you know, for public discourse, that's not not heroic. Uh, Just because you save somebody's life doesn't make you a hero. You have to save somebody's life by putting your life in danger, and then to me, that's when you get elevated to hero status, and you're definitely, uh, you know, in that category. Well, yeah, I I guess you could, if you could, if you look at it like that way and define it that way, possibly um but i don't know it's it's still difficult absolutely just to kind of take that and and, and you know getting outreach from people i had the head head basketball coach from georgia tech sent me a handwritten letter yesterday um just kind of sent his his thank you and appreciate it and he was proud of me so a lot of that's that's very very cool but it, it's still very very tough and uh, and that's one of the that's one of the um criteria for the the, the carnage to be fun is that you actually have to put your life on the line for somebody else so that's that's part of their criteria when they look at it I mean, they have others as well but that is one of them um i don't think they would just look at it as if you did not if you weren't in any danger and, and save somebody i don't think that would, would meet the criteria and i'm also with you know when it comes to uh, first responders and stuff like that because a lot of people say well that's that's not heroism they're getting paid to do that that's their job <laughs> now now to to go out there every day knowing that at any moment, you could be called to put your life on the line for someone you don't even know. You know? Yeah, yeah. and it's and it was pretty cool that, uh, that it was the Lynn Haven Fire Department, I think, responded, and, and uh, we were sitting there, and we were watching the fire, and those guys just walked right up to the vehicle. And this was at the point where it was fully engulfed, and they, you know, they walked. <laughs> there were like five, six feet of it. I'm like, oh, you guys are nuts. And so, yeah, I mean, those guys and, uh, you know, I have friends who are police officers, EMTs, and, and they do that every single day. And, and to me, that's the epitome of a hero. And, yeah, you could say they get paid for it, but we all know they don't get paid as much as they need right. to be. Um, so, yeah, they do that every single day. And I have a whole new respect um, after that experience for what they do because they do that every single day. They see their families. They say goodbye, not knowing that they'll be back that day. So uh, that's, you know, my hats go off to them. I have a lot of respect for a lot of our first responders. And uh, Noah, you're a former, you know, uh, student athlete there at Florida Tech playing for them from uh, 96 to 99. Uh, what are you doing these days? 
Uh, right now, I'm a, I'm a financial advisor with Raymond James. I work on a team with my father and uh, Tom King and Amanda Jowers, uh, Tree Path Financial. So that's what we do currently, and it's been uh, it's been a great experience uh, working along with my dad. He is he is something else. He's got over 40 years experience. So I've gotten to learn a lot from him, and and our new business partner Amanda. She brings a whole new element. So uh, right now, we're just working with families, uh, you know, small business owners and, and and individuals, just helping them grow their grow their grow their uh, their wealth and help them retire. All right. Well. Let me get some financial advice then before uh, I get, get you off. <laughs> I have zero dollars. How do I grow that zero dollars and do uh, something like retire off? <laughs> That's going to be a tough one. That's going to be tough growing zero dollars. You can start with one dollar. We can work on that. Okay. Zero dollars is going to be tough. Uh, I, actually, I think I, that's what I do have. I think I have literally one dollar in my wallet. Uh, Noah well, King. With, you can work with one dollar. You can, you can grow that one dollar. All right. Noah King, thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much. I have a good morning. All right. Bye-bye.